My name's Kyle Roggenbuck. I'm here with Jay Nygaard. He's on work release. He's okay. He's perfectly I, safe. I, I only got a half hour. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we jest, but we're also very serious about that. Um, we're at the panel of the Jaws of the Beast. Um, both Jay and I were, have been subjected over the last numerous years by uh, unfair, unlawful, un-American, on anything you can imagine, actions uh, by our government that we loved, supported, and believed in basically turned on us. So we're going to tell you a couple stories. I'm going to lead off and give like, a couple questions, and Jay's going to give his story, let you ask a couple questions, and kind of open it up for anything. So we're going to try to keep our... We're both naturally long-winded, so we have a gentleman's agreement to keep it very brief, so I'll, I'll get her going here. Um, this is 2016. In the summer of 2013, uh, my home was raided by agents of the Alcohol Gambling Enforcement Division of the State of Minnesota's Department of Public Safety. That's important because it's was doing nothing unsafe. Um, they were looking for an illicit wine operation. They had received a tip from somebody somewhere that I was illegally making wine in my home. A little background story is I did own a winery. I was partnered. I was in the process of applying for my own permits. Everything was above the board. I had the last signature sitting on a city council person's desk for my CUP, which is a basically a conditioner use permit, I believe, conditional use permit. And one Tuesday, I get a frantic call from my then wife saying that our house has been ransacked and I hustle home and everything in our home is gone. I finally got my stuff back last Tuesday. <laughs> they kept my home computer, my daughter's school computer, my son's white noise generator, uh, a couple other computers, my tax documents, so I had to file extensions for taxes, and for a year and a half refused to even allow me to see my evidence. I went through 17 different hearings. There's a gentleman that we were talking about, he's just walking in. Uh, about, I, I literally went to 17 different hearings before I even got my day in court. Um, luckily, unluckily, I was laid off from time to time, so I was able to go to these hearings. Uh, when it all boiled down to it, I was charged with felony winemaking, two gross misdemeanors, illegal sale of weapons, and felony failure to store a firearm safely around children or some bunk like that. Because when they came to my home, they realized that I had a brand new shotgun laying on a counter living room table or something still on the box and a six month old baby living there. So that's apparently unsafe for them. Um, I went through several hearings. Ultimately they realized that I did nothing illegal but they needed their conviction. So they said, tell you what, we will drop the charges on the felonies if you accept this thing called diversion. Does anybody know what diversion is? Diversion means yes, you I plead do. guilty yeah, diversion means you plead guilty, confess your crimes, pay all your fines, and then at the end of your probation period, you can have it expunged, and it goes from convicted to dismissed to off your record. And I said, well, how long is that going to last? The judge says, huh, through this election cycle. They knew I was running as a libertarian in District 38A against his best friend, Linda Runbeck. Gee, no surprise they stretched this out two years until right before election cycle to make me this offer, all right? The gun charge. We ultimately went to trial on the gun charge. Bench trial. No, jury trial. It's been a blur. Uh, in that jury trial, we were able to show that they never fired these alleged weapons that they found unsafely stored, and there were three of them all of a sudden that they moved every single one before they took photos of it, that they loaded each one before they took photos of it, and that they never found a single photo of me holding the weapons in all of my computers, which I was married at the time. There were pictures I didn't want them to see, which they loved to talk about in court, which had nothing to do with anything. And 
they never even bothered to find out if any of those dumps were registered. No, you can't see them. <laughs> and they never bothered to find out if any of the dumps were registered to me. So this all comes into court. We display all this to court. And ultimately, the jury came back with a question to the judge. I thought, no problem. They proved nothing. The guns were moved. They, didn't, they loaded them themselves. They grabbed the wrong cases. They put them in the wrong holsters. They did everything wrong. The jury comes back with the question. It says, does the child actually have to be present to be considered negligently accessible to children? Well, the answer is obviously yes, right? Because if the child's not there, it's not negligibly accessible. The judge says no. You just have to prove that a child at one point was in the home. So I was ultimately convicted, and uh, I went to file an appeal. It was going to be a $8,000 process, but in the meantime, the judge says, I'm sending you to jail right now, and you're paying all your fines right now. No, sorry, you've broken this law, this law, this law, and this law of all the evidence tracking and all of the um, rights of the trial and the submission of evidence and, and everything. We're appealing all of this. The judge says, well, that's fine. You're still going to jail for a little while. And we said, wait a minute. You can't send somebody to jail within 30 days because that's their appeal time. The judge said, too bad. So ultimately, I decided not to pursue the appeal because I didn't have the $8,000. The probation department said, we're going to wipe it off your record at the end of this year anyway. We're not going to make you wait two years. The Anoka County probation department is going to bat for me. And so then I'm, at the end of this year, it's all going to go away. But they did say we were instructed that we have to keep you on the books until after the election. So they stripped my right to vote, my right to run for office. They took all of my kids' things. Two and a half years of jumping through hoops. And just last Tuesday, I had to get a court order to have them release my stuff. Because the Alcohol Gambling Enforcement Division they wanted to look. That's the short version. The long version is when you take away an infant baby with colic's white noise generator, daddy don't get much sleep, and that kind of pissed me off. But that's my short version. <laughs> fresh from Hennepin County Jail, I give you Jane Agar. Not quite fresh, but fresh enough. I don't know how many out there, I asked this earlier, how many out there have heard of me or my story? Okay, a few. You know, I, I am guilty. What I'm guilty of is being ignorant of thinking that things could be fair and that laws are followed in our country. And I found out that especially when it comes to local, municipal type things, the law be damned. And that's what's happened to me. I, as you can see, this is my badge of honor right here. Turn I got around, this, sir. Turn around. I got this right after I got out of jail and I decided I was going to go and talk to my city council about real criminals, actually the people on the city council who had to bend to jail for real crimes. And unfortunately in my city, it seems to be kind of systematic. I'm not the only one who's gone to jail for so-called property violations. But what's unusual about my circumstance is I have a codified state right in a 1995 state statute that says I have the right to harvest the wind. My city has no statute controlling wind turbines although they kept claiming all these other statutes applied. And I ran into judges who really didn't care. I was prejudged before the first day I walked in the courtroom, and that's how it happened all the way along. Every single judge I ran into was prejudged, and I got a buddy of mine here, and it's kind of funny because one day after they were there in the courtroom with me, we got outside, and they just looked at me and said, man, you're lucky they don't have a rope in there because it would just all be over now. And th th that's the way it's been. What happened to me? I put up a wind turbine. I knew I could. There's no ordinances. I've been on the city council and planning commission, and I put it up, and my city started chasing me. Now, this terrible wind turbine was on a 10-foot pole and was nine feet tall, so it wasn't any taller than the side of our house. It's in the gutter. I put in a building permit with the city. First thing the city lady says is, well, we don't allow wind turbines, and if we don't allow something in Orno, you can't have it. And I'm thinking of this little city minion, and I'm going, wait a minute. I was on the planning commission and city council. I know that's not how it works. So I did a little research, decided, you know what, I get to put it up, and I did. And the city promptly sued me. Well, before they sued me, they sent the police over to 
go through my yard and take pictures without a warrant. Uh, they uh, did a few things like that. And then all of a sudden we get sued. And I couldn't help but laugh. I'm going, this is just ridiculous. My neighbor's got a boathouse down by the lake that was put in before the ordinance. He gets to keep it. Why don't I? You know, fair is fair. Well, found out fair really isn't fair. Went in front of Judge Rosenbaum, who I must say is very ignorant of the law. And she got her city law from the city lawyer to the point where my lawyer had to do this at one point and go, hey, are we included in this discussion? And she ruled against us, claiming... Although the city never gave a survey showing the location, she said it appears the turbine is located too close to this, it appears this, and it appears that, and that's how we lost. So we appealed it, got to the appeals court, and my lawyer put together a real good brief, and by the time we were done, the appeals court ruled for us. We win. They said it's no different than a basketball hoop or a flagpole or clothesline. We don't see what the issue is. So they sent it back to the uh, court, and the city decided, well, that's another opportunity to go after them. So they sent us building permit stuff and all these other things, and we sent them a letter back going, we don't get it. You don't need a building permit for a basketball hoop. Why are you doing this to us? Deal with your statutes. Well, that came as non-compliance with the city in front of the judge. We went and ended up in front of the same judge for the same reasons we, she was overturned before, and she ruled against us again all uppity and worried, oh, I gotta get this right, I gotta get this right, and I even have this in the transcript where she says, I don't do this very much, I don't know very much about cities and ordinances. <laughs> and I'm just dumbfounded. So we get to the appeals court, my lawyer writes up basically the same appeal, and saying, you know, this is double jeopardy, you've already prosecuted it for this and lost. And we get to the appeals court and he files it, and he filed it electronically with opposing counsel because at that point they were switching over from personal service. City jumped on that, the appeals court jumped on it, and we lost and were overturned because they, not because they didn't get the documents, but because he filed it in a way that they considered to be inappropriate at the time. So we lost. After we lost, we didn't know what to do, and the city didn't bother us for a while, then they started bothering us to take it down. And at that point, we started looking for another attorney, and we ran into Mr. Cardall, who did some good research, which I wish my other attorney had done, and found that there's a 1995 state law that gives every person, any person in the, right, in the state, the right to harvest the wind. And, you know, I grew up in Orono, and we had farms with windmills when I grew up there. You know, my buddy, uh, who wrote an affidavit, going, look, a farm across the street had a 32-volt system, to, you know, until like 1940-something, because that's what they did to run their farm. And that none of this mattered to the judge, or judges, or any of them. So we got in front of Judge Rosenbaum again, so wait a minute, we have a state right to have this. She's like, well, that's too bad. And she ordered us to take it down and put us in contempt and threatened my wife here and I with six months in jail each. And we stood up to the judge, and our lawyer did an emergency appeal and got the appeals court to stay the order. In the meantime, we had other neighbors suing us over it, and they called it a nuisance. And, well, yeah, like, there are, like nobody has a nuisance. And this same judge, while she was ruling against us at the end, this is like really the key, she says to opposing counsel, well, if it turns out they have a right to have it, then it's a different story. Great, I've got that in the transcript. So we went back to that same judge with her own words. It said, if it turns out, and I even testified we have a right to have it. I might not have had the statute, but it was put out there. And she looked at us and said, well, you should have told me the law sooner. One more time. What is wrong with you that you aren't following the law? Now, this is a judge, by the way, which I found out from a Channel 5 news article, who uh, lets off 83% of convicted felons caught with a firearm off with less than a mandatory sentence. But if you're a white boy from Orono and you got a wind turbine, you and your wife are off to jail. And that's the way she treated it, and it was just sad. So we're, we're actually in the middle of appealing that one still uh, because of all the irregularities. But anyways, as Orno kept chasing us, I finally gave in. My wife had had enough. I took the turbine and pulled down. I got him off the property. I don't understand how a judge can order me to remove my stuff from my property. Where else am I going to put it? But I got it off, it's at a friend's now, 
and it came push to shove, you gotta get the footing out. So I chopped the top of the footing out of there. I re realized it was so close to the house that I was hurting the foundation. So I got my uh, saws all off. I chopped all the anchor bolts, got them all off of there, buried it, put a couple of compost bins over it, finished up the area. <coughs> not good enough. <laughs> nope, not even close to good enough. So the city kept pushing it. They kept sending letters to uh, the judge saying, hey, you gotta put these guys in jail, they haven't complied. Now in the meantime, while all this is going on, the city of Orono enacted an ordinance completely banning wind turbines in violation of state law. We sued them, we got it overturned, and we won. None of this seems to matter to any of the judges. So finally it gets to the point where he writes letters, two letters saying they both gotta go to jail, it's gotta be done. So at that point, I didn't want to wreck my house. I got a signed and stamped engineering document from a structural engineer, state of Minnesota SEAL. He works for Orno. Says, no, no, leave that footing there. It's gonna damage a house. I got the same thing from a MnDOT civil engineer, a signed affidavit, and I got the same thing from a 43-year demolition expert. Leave it there, it can come out when the house comes down. I got to court, and the way the judge was talking, I knew what was going on. I turned around to my son, said, here, take my phone. Take my stuff, I gave him everything. Sure enough, when it came time for her to lecture us, she called those documents excuses. And I'm looking at her going, how could you say that when you could not be sitting on this bench, on this floor, in this building without those documents? Never could have made the building. So boom, there I am, hauled off to jail. So I got jail Friday night. Ended up in there for five days. My wife, my son, my daughter, everybody got together with a heroic effort. Got a hold of a friend of a friend who ran a bobcat and his dad had had problems with the county. He got it. He spent an entire Sunday in a heroic effort. On and on, I spent $140 on the phone talking to these people as we're getting through this that weekend. And the one thing he told me was, this is the hardest chunk of concrete I run into in years. So he didn't have any fun doing it and it was a big pain but they got it out. So the next day, we get the inspector there right away. No problem, I see it's gone, big old hole, all this stuff. And as we're waiting and waiting for the city, finally my lawyer gets out of there and says, well, the city attorney's traveling and we're not gonna deal with any of his stuff till he gets back in town. <laughs> what? I'm supposed to sit there in jail because he's out of town. Now the best part about this was, he didn't have time to deal with any of this, but he did have a time to do a national Fox News and lie. He had time to tell Fox News that they never once wanted us to go to jail, that this was an unfortunate situation and all that. And it's funny because I got two documents where he says that in the month leading up to it, and that was his closing statement was these two people need to go to jail for six months. So, city attorneys. <coughs> Anyways, my wife, God bless her that day, went up to City Hall because she was not going to leave until she had an affidavit out of that inspector. And he might have been kind of a good guy, but he wasn't truthful. He sat in court when the judge said he was gonna to have to sign an affidavit, and he's like, oh, I didn't know I had to. But she got it out of him, got it to my lawyer, my lawyer got it to the judge. You know what the judge says? Well, I'm inclined to release him, but I'm not going to until the city responds. So I had to spend a whole nother night in jail waiting for the city to respond, which by the way, they never did. By 2.30 the next day, uh, because my lawyer kept bugging him, she finally signed the release order and got me out of jail. So I spent five days in jail for something the state of Minnesota specifically calls out as my right. That's why I wear this, and that's why I'm running for Senate, because it's wrong. Local municipalities are out of control. Big government is out of control. It's ridiculous. I mean, this is just a small part of my story. I got a whole nother where the police department's been harassing me, where I've been charged where they know there aren't crimes, and I've had to fight a bunch of that off at the same time as they try to crush my wife and I into financial submission. And that's ultimately what this is about. I mean, we, we gave the, uh, the brief version because we understood and agree that we're two people here. There are heroes sitting right there that went to bat when he was unable to defend himself because he was put in jail. I know I've heard stories from that gentleman in the back there in the stripes. Um, this happens to all of us, okay? This happens to all of us. And, and when you prove the government wrong, they double down. They will double down and Every come time. after you. Every Yet, 
Yet. You don't know what it's like until you're in jail. Exactly. Yet, who here saw the CARE 11 news report of those two yeah. cops pulling up to that drunk yeah. whack in his mole in the parking lot of Mills Fleet Farm in Blaine? They're about to read him the riot act. They're hauling him off to jail. They've called for the tow truck. Then they find out he's a cop yeah. from another district. So they arrange for him. Well, first they help him pull up his pants and pack away his other weapon. <laughs> then they arrange for a ride home for him, and one of the officers takes his car home for him. Do you see what's going on here? This is, who, who else here has been the victim of some police or court overreach? Not just taxes, but just, you know, you're in a pack of 11 cars. You're the one that gets pulled over for speeding. You know, it happens to all of us. But, and the thing is, you almost never see it coming. And we're all ignorant in that we believe we live in America and it's fair. <laughs> Nothing's fair around here. I got busted because I applied for the permits and had them all signed off. He got busted because he found the laws, filed the permits, and followed the rules. If I was making wine in my garage, nobody would have known any different if I had kept my mouth shut. If he had just put up the wind turbine and didn't say anything, nobody would have noticed because it wasn't loud. It was one of those, it was a spindle style, which, which are, are silent runners, you know? Interesting side thing on the law about wine. You look at section 340A. That's what I was convicted under for wine. I'm now convicted felon multiple times because of this, um, which is wonderful for trying to find a job, by the way, and trying to explain to us because I filed for a winery permit and you know they said I was selling wine illegally and threatened to shut down two other wineries that I was doing business with if they didn't lie and turn against me. And I was like, I don't care. I'm just, just going to do it for a hobby or whatever. It's illegal for everybody to manufacture wine. Section 340A, illegal manufacture of wine. There is no provision in section 340A under which I was convicted, which allows you to go to Northern Brewer or Brew and Grow and buy a kit of wine and make it yourself. Even if you're self-use? Correct. The second that self-use wine leaves your doorstep, to go with to your mom's house for Mother's Day, you have just committed a felony. Even in her own stump? No, or, or in a bar? Yeah. Oh, okay. You have committed a felony. <laughs> it is very limited to stays in your house for internal consumption only. You cannot even give any of that to a friend. It goes from legal winemaking to felony illegal manufacture, penalties up to $10,000 and a year in jail. Happy Mother's Day. Is that yeah. beer too? Beer too. Really? Beer. Oh, beer has to stay on your premises. And I even asked a judge, I said, so regardless of container, if that wine, I said, no, I said, regardless of what the wine is in, if it leaves my property, that's a felony. He says, yeah. I said, even if I drank it <laughs> and then went for a walk? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he goes, well, not technically. He, he goes, but what if you brought, you could have brought some to your neighbor. I said, well, see, Judge, that's the problem. You could have. Yeah. You got your warrant based upon you saw me make wine and give it to my neighbor. Somebody said that. I live in an association where we own all the streets and all the physical property around. That's private property. None of it ever left the private property of the association, which signed off. Court no, affidavit no, that I'm allowed to to sell or you know move about in their our associated property. The judge says, "Well, I don't really care about that part of the law." <laughs> in both of our cases, the judges were presented with the law, and I went through several judges. You went through several judges. And each time, the judge said, "I don't care about the law." Then you bring up the fact that U.S. and state law is is to be interpreted under contractual law, which means any, I'm gonna make up a word because I don't know the real word, any nebulosity in the law <laughs> is written on in favor of, interpreted in favor of the one who did not write that contract. That actually is a good word. Nebulosity, I like it. It's a word now. We're libertarians, we can make our own language. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else understands us anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Another good word, which means nothing, is testiculosity. But he was going to throw it in somewhere. <laughs> so, 
this can happen to all of us, okay? It, I'm it sure does, it's happened it to others. It does. 